Hey, what's up? It's Tati back with another review of AEW Dynamite. And I want to apologize now that if I do sound annoyed during this review, it's because I felt like we didn't get what we should have gotten. This was a go home show. And when it comes to go home shows, this is AEW's last moment to convince you to buy into their pay per views. The pay per view is $50. That is a lot of money, especially for most people. Now, I normally don't have issues with spending that kind of money if I feel like the show is going to be good, but you gotta convince people before they actually buy it. If this was their way of convincing people to buy this pay-per-view with this dynamite, I think they're in trouble. Guys, let's get into this review. Oh my gosh, there's just so much to talk about. So this week, we finally got Orange Cassidy versus Kyle Fletcher. And you guys, I almost cried my eyes out on Sunday when Kyle had to relinquish both uh, the IWGP Tag Team Titles and the New Japan Openweight Tag Team Titles because Mark Davis is injured and they cannot defend them. So he had to give up the titles. Now... Here they are with AEW, and tonight, uh, Tony Khan did confirm that uh, Aussie Open is all elite, so I'm really, really excited about that. However, I had high hopes for this match, and unfortunately, I found it underwhelming. I do follow uh, Kyle Fletcher outside of AEW, and I see him in the ring, and this match right here just didn't represent what I see with Kyle outside of AEW. Now, he's had really, really great matches in uh, with AEW, especially with ROH these past few weeks, so we've seen him at his best, and this was not it, and I'm going to be honest and say that I think it has something to do with Orange Cassidy. AEW... Their commentators are talking about Orange Cassidy throughout the match like, we're AEW, we gave birth to Orange Cassidy, look at our child grow up. And it's like them really shoving Orange Cassidy to the fans, um, they're booking him in a way to look good. So no matter what Kyle Fletcher did to Orange Cassidy, Orange Cassidy uh, rose out of the ashes and continued on to win this match. Now, I feel like I've noticed this with a few competitors that some wrestlers seem to not be their usual selves to help get uh, Orange Cassidy over. Not in the sense that he had to win, but in the sense that he had to look better than his opponent. And I felt like this was one of those times uh, with Kyle Fletcher. Oh my gosh, he is amazingly talented in the ring. And you just really couldn't see it with this match. I'm sorry to say, like, if you don't follow Kyle, you're not going to know what I'm talking about. Um, this was disappointing to me. I expected a lot more, but... Looking at it now, I see all this was really just to get uh, Orange Cassidy even more over. Either way, we do got a 21-man Black Jab Battle Royal on uh, Double or Nothing, and I'm really hoping that somebody gets that title out of his hands on board with Orange Cassidy. If they were to switch up something about him, maybe he would be a little more over in my eyes. So after that match, we have Ricky Starks, who is doing an interview with Renee, and He's talking about how he's been fighting with Juice and with Jay White. And I thought he was going to say that a double or nothing, he wanted to do a handicap match with both of them. And to be honest, I would have been cool with that because we have not seen a handicap match in AEW in a really, really long time. I actually can't really think of the last time I've seen one. And I thought that, hey, something that is so normal in professional wrestling will actually seem a little rare to see in AEW. But instead, we get Ricky saying that he's going to be part of the 21-man Blackjack Battle Royal for the international title. And I was kind of disappointed with that um, based off of him already having a storyline going on. Now, I don't feel like his storyline with Jay and Juice are 
is a strong storyline. If anything, it's like they have beef with me and it's on site every time we see each other. And that's literally what happened. He got attacked by both Juice and Jay. And I really wish this would have ended up being a handicap match. I really think that would have been cool to see something we have not seen in AEW for a while. Now, we had FTR come out in the ring and they're talking shit about um Jay Lethal and friends and how after they finished with them they might as well go to TNA or whatever and all that was all right uh but then Mark Briscoe comes into the ring he's really upset about what happened when Dax had pile drived him last week because he was blinded uh so he could not see and didn't know that he hit the pile driver on Mark Briscoe he's like Mark you know we cool or whatever um you know shake my hand and let's get through this and Mark didn't want to shake his hand. Then he said it again, and he still didn't want to. And this time, Mark bitch slapped him, and Dax was really upset. Cash had to hold him back and say, yo, we homies, let's not get physical or whatnot. And it just seems like Mark Briscoe's over the whole storyline. And guess what? I am too. I'm over it, okay? He comes out the rain. Karen Jarrett, Karen Jarrett is right there. He pushes her out the way. He pushes... Um, Sanjay Dunn out the way. Um, he hits, um, Jay, Jeff Jarrett. And then he goes up to Jay Lethal and he said, yo, we cool like the other side of the pillow. I don't give a damn about all these other clowns you hang out with. You and I are cool and I'm tired of being part of this bullshit. And then he walked off. And I don't know what's going to happen here, but he's going to be the referee for that match. So I don't know. We'll see where that goes. To be honest, I don't really understand where the storyline is going. Um, it just feels like something they threw together or whatnot, but just something about it felt like really bad acting tonight. I really wasn't feeling it. Um, I just hope that after Double or Nothing, they're done with this storyline and Jay Lethal get to do things on his own because that's what I want to see. Him and singles competition and not with these clowns, like Mark Briscoe says. Next, we had an open house match with uh, House of Black and Blake Christian, Meta League, and AR Fox. Now, if you don't watch ROH, you're going to think that uh, the other team it has just been put together just to be put together, but they're actually a six man tag um, team in ROH. We've seen them many times. Um, however, I do believe these three individuals are best on their own. So with that being said, this match, I felt like something was lacking. We did have a lot of great moments with both teams. Now, here's the biggest issue I had with this is that when you watch this, you realize that House of Black have not been around much. And also, while they seem to have, you know, a connection with all the members and they seem to be some type of characters, there's no storyline. There's nothing really behind them. Um... And that's a big problem. Double or nothing, obviously, this weekend. And they're not even on the card. And for whatever reason, it's just like, well, they do really well in the ring. But who is the House of Black? And that's not because they're mysterious. That's because AEW hasn't done anything to make people ask that question. And unfortunately, um, that faction is probably going to suffer because of that. And I'm really hoping they take time to build anybody who who's who is holding gold and i feel like they have not done that they put a really big focus on the whole elite bcc thing and i really love those guys or whatnot however the people who are holding gold are suffering because there's no real character development there's no storyline um nothing's really going on with that so coming into this match i kind of felt like there was already a disinterest um, in this match, but everybody did okay. I just felt like the audience wasn't really feeling it, especially since they, you know, dimmed the lights and whatnot. Something about this is really, really off, and it just felt like a match that they put together. I really, really hope they sit down and think what they can do with House of Black. Me, as a horror, as a horror fan, when I look at House of Black, I can just come up with ideas of things that I would love to see AEW do with them, but they just not thinking in that route. And unfortunately, they have three really great individuals that I think they could really push the envelope with. And unfortunately, that is just not what's happening. House of Black obviously retains a trio's title. However, something about this was just lacking. 
AW fix it, please. So now we have a promo with MJF. Now we heard from Sammy and Jungle Boy earlier. They had uh, one of them had like a pre-recorded promo, and the other one was doing a um, interview with Renee. And to be honest, they're saying shit that we've heard already, so I'm not even gonna get into that. MJF comes into the ring and he says what he normally says. Um, however, he has great energy. Um, he comes off like the perfect heel. So even though some of the things I've heard before, I'm okay with it. Then we get Darby Allen who comes in the ring and, you know, he's still saying things that we've already heard. A lot of the promos in this storyline has fallen flat. They started off really, really strong. And from there, um, they started flat. Now, here's the issue with this, uh, you know, whole storyline is that they started off really, really well. And the fact that Tony Khan considered having the four pillars, um, young guys who has been with AEW ba basically from the start to be in the main event scene, I think was absolutely brilliant. However, somewhere along the way, things just fell flat. Now, here's my issue though. Maybe I'm a little old school, but I feel like MJF is holding the top prize in AEW. And yet they are in the middle of the show. They're not closing out the show with really good promos. This is absolutely insane. Once again, we have ended the show with the elite and the BCC thing. And it's like, I'm interested in that. I am all invested in that. However, uh, MGF is holding th the biggest prize in AEW, and it almost doesn't feel like they're taking it as the biggest prize in AEW. So I really don't like that. I just feel like something is lacking here uh, once it comes to this storyline. And I'm really disappointed with how it ended up right before the pay-per-view now, we do have MJF who attacks Darby. Sammy comes to get his hits in. Um, when he comes in the ring, MJF slips out the ring, and he's walking up the ramp. And then Jungle Boy comes out, gives him a clothesline, and Jungle Boy is on the ramp holding the triple B. And I'm like, eh, man, it is what it is. It's nothing special. To be honest, it's not supposed to be like this. We're the biggest prize in AEW. And... Really, had it been someone else holding the gold or someone else feuding with MJF, it would have been a whole different types of feel. Tony Khan decided to take a chance with all four of these pillars, and he should have taken that chance all the way to the pay-per-view, and I'm kind of disappointed with that. Hmm. Next, we had Taya Valkyrie versus Lady Frost, and um, this one was... Not all that. It was okay. We did have Jade, Smart Mark, and Layla. They're watching from the top of the ramp. And to be honest, I kind of expected to see a little bit more with this match. Obviously, with Taya going for the TBS title at Double or Nothing, this match was to make her look good at the last second. And to be honest, it just didn't make her look better, just showed what she could do in the ring, but nothing of significance. I was expecting this match to be a little bit better, uh, but for whatever reason, it just didn't turn out that way, so I really didn't care. Obviously, Taya takes the win. I just didn't really feel much watching this at all. If this was supposed to help sell me into believing that Taya was going to end up winning the title at Double or Nothing, this didn't help. Now, after that, we had the contract signing with Adam Cole and Chris Jericho. There cannot be any physicality between these two. And this whole segment felt a little bit weird. Chris Jericho had his whole entourage with him. And then Adam Cole had Roderick Strong with him. I'm kind of like not really feeling it like that because I don't want Roderick Strong to come off to be like a sidekick since he's only been here for a couple of weeks. But either way, the whole thing just fell a little flat to me. Um, by the time that they end up signing the contracts, um, we do have um, Adam Cole saying that, you know, there's five of y'all and, you know, I, I got a little enforcement myself. 
So I'm thinking, holy shit, we're going to get Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish. I don't really care about Bobby Fish like that, but I just thought that's where we were going. And then he goes, oh, this person lives in Las Vegas. And I'm like, well, who them live in Las Vegas? I have no idea. Um, and then we find out that it's Sabu. It felt really um, random. It really did. Now, I didn't mind seeing Sabu. Matter of fact, I think I remember recently hearing that Sabu had some type of health complications recently. I'm not 100% sure. Um, so for whatever reason, he comes out or whatever, and I'm just like, this is it? I thought we were going to get somebody else. So to be honest, I'm not too excited about it, but um, I'm not bothered by it. I just want things to happen in wrestling that just makes sense. Either way, the whole contract signing wasn't all that for me. Next, we transition from that horrible moment to uh, Daniel Garcia versus Roderick Strong. Now, I did have high hopes for this, but I think what made it not as great as it should be was timing. Now, they were right before the main event, and I felt like had they been maybe a little earlier on in the show um, and their match was longer, we would have seen a really great exchange between these two. Now, things get did get a little technical between them. However, it felt a little rushed, like we got to get this done because the main event is coming on type of thing. And it's like, damn, I really would like to see more from them. So hopefully in the future, we get to see a storyline between these two and a much better match, something that probably might end up on a pay-per-view. Now, Roderick Strong does take the win, which I think was expected, but it just felt like if this lasted a little bit longer, this could have been one of the best matches of the night for sure. Now on to the best match of the night. Obviously, it's Claudio Castagnoli, Wheel of Yuta versus the Lucha Brothers. These guys always do a great job in the ring. So I was not worried about if they would do a good job or not. Now, I am a little bit disappointed and wish that, you know, the, the AEW world title uh, scene would have closed out the show. But it seems like there's more. they're taking more of an importance to the whole Elite BCC storyline. I do enjoy it. However, I kind of wish that wasn't the case with the go-home show. Now, we already knew that it was going to do a great job in this match. To be honest, I really wasn't sure if the Lucha Brothers would end up losing these titles. What I was confused about was um, if it should have been on ROH or not. Now, from a marketing standpoint, I was thinking maybe they're having the match on AEW Dynamite to kind of promote... ROH. And to be honest, that was not the case. I don't think that convinced anybody to say, you know what, I'm going to go by the Honor Club. I don't think that convinced anyone. But either way, we had a really great match with them. And I knew that somehow, somewhere, the Elite was going to either get involved during the match or there was going to be an attack after the match. So what ended up happening is that throughout the whole match, we don't know this yet, but the Young Bucks has been under the ring. And right before it seems like Claudia and Wheeler can get the win, we do have the Young Bucks slip out from under the ring and they grab Claudio and they held him back from getting in the ring to help Wheeler take the win. So then Lucha Brothers end up retaining the ROH title. And then Moxley comes out and he's ready to fight. I don't know where the hell he came from, but he wasn't there during the match. And to be honest... That whole ending felt flat because it's like after everything that we've seen y'all do along this whole storyline, this doesn't compare to anything else with y'all just helping them lose the match. It just didn't feel like anything. For the BCC, yeah, they could have had more gold. However, from a fan standpoint watching this, it just didn't feel like, okay, we're heading into a pay-per-view. So it, I don't know. It just felt flat as far as them continuing the storyline within that match. But the match was definitely the best match of the night. So I'm just kind of disappointed with how they ended off the show. But I am interested in seeing that match. Now, they're going to have a um, Anarchy in the Arena uh, match. And to be honest, I didn't like the last one they did with Jericho Appreci Appreciation Society. It was all over the place and not in a good way. So hopefully they've learned from that last match and they'll make this match better. To be honest, the show, 
it was, I couldn't even give it a three out of five stars because for a go home show, it should have been much more solid. And I just don't understand why they keep prioritizing the elite BCC storyline over the world title. And that kind of sucks because, you know, the title is going to end up losing prestige when you do things like this, uh, when you're not prioritizing who's supposed to be the top guy. And I don't care if it's a heel or not. That should be your main priority with having people feel like there is a lot of prestige with the world title. And right now, it sort of kind of don't feel like that. So yes, I'm a little annoyed with this go home show. Guys, thanks so much for watching my review. I'll be back tomorrow with my review for ROH. Bye.